Hi guys, I'm Christina G, and um, so I work at a company called Dome Yard LP. Now, just by a raise of hands, now how many of you guys have heard of this company before what they do, maybe a little bit? Uh, okay, not a lot of you. <laughs> um, so I guess I'll introduce ourselves and, and what we do first. Um, so Dome Yard is uh, basically a hedge fund. Uh, we're a hedge fund structure, but we focus on what's called low latency trading. Uh, now before I begin, of course, I wanted to just thank the uh, Boston Data Festival people and the staff who organized this event. Um, it's just really amazing to hear, you know, a whole day of um, people from all these different industries talking about the data-related challenges that they face. Uh, so at Dome Yard, what we do is um, we focus on data-related challenges in finance. So we apply data to finance. Now, um, specifically, we're a low-latency trading firm with a focus on uh, electronic market making and statistical arbitrage or stat art strategies in all kinds of uh, different markets that we trade in. So uh, we actually started out of a, a dorm room a couple years ago, uh, which makes us a little different from the other hedge funds out there. Uh, we started with almost no money and almost uh, no connections. And it was through uh, creating the right technologies, uh, a lot of which I'll uh, explain to you today. It was also through um, basically creating a culture that welcomed the best and brightest uh, researchers and developers in the world. So it's creating this type of atmosphere um, and also focusing our strategies on a part of the marketplace in which we knew we would be one of the best in the world. So it was through a variety of these factors that we were able to become a competitive firm today. Uh, so that's about it for the introduction, I guess. Um, and of course, uh, I'll take questions afterwards. So anyway, many people have asked us, you know, why do we need to be fast? You know, why can't you just uh, go and trade in other markets today like other people do? <laughs> why do you have to go into this high-frequency trading room? Uh, well, the main reason is that we make predictions on a lot of interrelated products. Uh, so for, for instance here, the futures basis is related to interest rates. Um, another example, let's say Microsoft. Microsoft, uh, their stock price is related to the S&P 500 index, which is, uh, you know, then the S&P 500 index is also related to um, the S&P 500, the futures contract, uh, and it's also related to index options, it's related to uh, other equity indices like the NASDAQ 100. So everything is really interrelated today in, in the markets. In fact, they're so interrelated that it's rare to find a product that's completely isolated. Um, so, what does that mean? Well, when we modify one prediction on a product, like on Microsoft, for instance, well then, we have to modify all of our orders in, uh, simultaneously in a ton of different marketplaces, on a ton of different securities and products that we're trading. Uh, and so that's, that's a lot, and it takes a lot of power to do that. Um, however, we have to be able to respond to these changes as quickly and efficiently as possible because if you miss out on, you know, if you miss out on one thing, the time adds up, the lag and the delay, you know, it adds up to being a lot. So um, that's one of the biggest reasons why being fast is better in the financial markets today. Now, the second reason, um, so first off, uh, you know, market makers uh, tend to be risk averse. So we are very risk averse. We would rather, um, let's see, we would rather, how do I describe this? Not, uh, how do I describe this in a way that makes sense? Um, basically, we'd rather not make any mistakes over making a bunch of right decisions, if that makes any sense. So we're extremely risk averse. We don't want to make a single mistake out there. Um, now, the mistakes that affect us the most are caused by a variety of different outliers out there. So um, let me just give you some examples of these outliers. Um, so for instance, uh, so here's a pretty crude example of you know, an outlier. Uh, when there's so many trades going on, you can imagine millions of trades happening every day, these types of outliers here are very, very difficult to spot. Um, <laughs> you can't spot them by eye, and uh, it's really hard to get a machine to, to find these outliers too. So now to understand how difficult this is then, um, let's compare this to the entire Twitter universe, which I assume some of you guys are familiar with, <laughs> um, you'll notice that the peak throughput, and it's kind of small to see, but you, it's, it's the peak throughput uh, in some of these markets, these financial markets alone, 
uh, is five times or sometimes you know 20 times greater than uh, the amount that Twitter has to handle every day. So um, you know, so what does that mean, right? That means that uh, we at Dome Yard and also other people in high frequency trading marketplaces, we have to process more data than even Twitter uh, on a daily basis. And if you think about it in, in that, you know, in that context here, um, if you think about it in that context, well, then that makes your average uh, big data startup seem pretty tiny because <laughs> as a startup here, we're less than 20 people and yet we're processing that much more data than Twitter right now. Um, in fact, let's say if we take just the opening hour of, of any ordinary day in the U.S. stock market, uh, you get something like this. So um, the, the pictures, you know, it's colorful and stuff, but what does it mean? It's, it's there are about 343 million messages uh, just for the opening hour of any day that we're trading. So that's a lot of uh, data that we have to process every day. Now, um, so in order to store all of this data, and we have to you know, constantly perform fact tests and analyses on historic data as well. In order to do both live data and also handle historic data, um, we have to be extremely fast. So, <laughs> so those are the main reasons. Now, um, most of you have probably heard of Flash Boys by now. Uh, you know, Flash Boys, they talk about how this uh, HFT service provider, they were digging uh, holes through mountains, wiring cables under rivers and through the ocean uh, just to get a couple of uh, milliseconds of uh, you know, reduced latency, just to save a couple milliseconds of time. And you think, wow, that's, that's ridiculous. <laughs> you know? um, so today in the marketplace, uh, to give you an example, today it would cost around $2.8 million more to reduce the time it takes to transmit a 64-byte packet from Aurora DC3, so that's the uh, CME data center in Illinois, all the way to Carter, New Jersey, which is uh, home of the NASDAQ, by uh, basically a nanosecond. <laughs> uh, so let me repeat that again, uh, so because it's a long sentence. Um, it costs almost $3 million to save a nanosecond of time uh, between the CME and the NASDAQ when transmitting a 64-byte packet. Yeah, that's just, that sounds ridiculous. <laughs> um, so now let's compare this for the developers out there. Let's compare this to uh, a context switch or a garbage collection cycle in Go or Java, right? Those things you might have heard of and been familiar with. Now, in modern hardware today, it typically takes about um, one to 10 milliseconds long uh, for these types of processes to run, for a garbage collection cycle to run, for instance. Now, one to 10 milliseconds, sorry. So one to 10 milliseconds, that's about uh, an eternity in high frequency trading terms. <laughs> but um, most developers today, of course, we don't care about that, right? Who cares about the latency of, of a garbage collection cycle? It doesn't matter, right? And yet, here we are in the high frequency space, and we're spending almost $3 million to save one ten thousandth of, of a second. <laughs> One ten thousandth of a of a uh, what is it? One ten thousandth of a, a garbage collection cycle, and it's just it's ridiculous. So that just shows you that's how competitive the HFT space is today. Um, at Dome Yard itself, so you know, in our company, uh, it costs about five, over a little over half a million dollars more uh, to reduce the next uh, fraction of a millisecond within our trading engine today, um, and so. Now, the, the, the question is now, is that worth it? Are we willing to spend that much money to reduce our latency by a fraction of a, of a millisecond? Well, we can do that, but then at some point, you're going to hit the stage where the marginal costs are going to exceed uh, the marginal revenue in the company. Uh, and so that's when we hit what's called a roadblock. So, um, so what do you do? What happens now that we've reached the, the fastest threshold that we could possibly get? Now that we're the fastest we can possibly get, um, how can we continue to be fast without uh, our capital expenditures going through the ceiling? <laughs> uh, so on the business side of things, there are a lot of solutions that HFT firms have done. Uh, so if you ever consider starting a high frequency trading firm, uh, here's some ways to save some money or uh, you know, some solutions. So one way is to trade more products. Uh, you can always start trading in uh, different marketplaces. Uh, you know, right now CME is super competitive, but there's other markets out there in Asia, in Singapore,
if you're more in Hong Kong, that might be more friendly towards high frequency traders. Uh, another solution is we could always sell infrastructure. Uh, for instance, uh, you know, just license and sell uh, microwave feeds. Uh, then another thing that a lot of high frequency traders do is they sell algorithmic execution services. Um, and so those are things that uh, we don't do yet. Um, except the first one, we do trade uh, we do trade more products. <laughs> Uh, the technical solutions out there, um, there's a lot of different solutions. One is to have uh, richer data sources. Uh, for instance, if you look at textual data, um, there's a lot of different service providers out there that provide different types of data that you can handle. Uh, the other thing is we can always discover more efficient technologies for low latency trading. It's another great way. Uh, and then another thing is just using better models, using um, more sophisticated trading models. Now, uh, when I mention more, more sophisticated trading models, though, most people are under the impression that uh, if you have more sophisticated trading models, that uh, your speed is going to go down, right? That there's kind of a, there's a, the impression that there's a trade-off between latency uh, and uh, sophistication, basically, and being smart. Can you be both fast and smart at the same time? So that's where the title of my uh, presentation comes into play. Can we be both fast and smart? Uh, at the same time. And um, so I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of areas in which uh, perhaps it is possible. Now, so several quantitative firms out there, since the two years we've been around, we've been around for that long, but since then, you know, a lot of uh, quantitative trading firms, they've thrown in the towel and they said, you know what, there's no way we're going to go into HFT. We're not going to spend millions of dollars just to you know, decrease our latency by a little bit. And I can I can empathize with them because when we first started off, um, you know, we had no money at all either. And um, we had to face incredible barriers of entry in, in this space. Uh, it's insane. Even to start a hedge fund alone, I mean, the cost can be in the millions. And then let alone, you know, going into HFT itself is just, an astronomical, astronomical price to pay. So, um, you know, I can understand that, but by doing some of the things that I have mentioned above, um, and also, uh, you know, by focusing on part of the markets in which we'd be one of the best, uh, we actually created a situation in which we, uh, basically the benefits of what we would do, are doing right now, uh, would outweigh the costs even, which is insane because the cost is already as high as it is, but we found a situation in which the benefits could be even greater than the cost. Now, um, the title of my talk is referring to you know, the convergence between fast technologies and better data and predictive models. We think that being fast um, and having better data in our models is not necessarily negatively correlated. And they're definitely, they're definitely not mutually exclusive. Um, now, when you hit the frontier of the cost-benefit trade-off uh, uh, for speed, then it's time to start getting creative, right? It's time to start um, making better use of your data or um, thinking outside of the box. And so that's what we've had to do many, many times. Uh, so I'm going to identify a few areas where we have done that in the past, and then I will identify some areas that need to be improved still in the industry, that we need to work together and you know, make sure that things get better, <laughs> um, where we can be you know, faster and smarter, and then also uh, how these improvements and innovations could benefit the data science community. Um, and also, oh, and also just to add more perspective, since I didn't mention this before, uh, we did start off with a team, you know, right now we have a team of less than 20 people, uh, and so to handle these challenges makes it incredibly difficult. We've had to um, do a lot of things to kind of optimize and save time. Uh, we've had to, you know, employ technologies at the cutting edge, uh, and then, so that way, you know, the, the quality of our software makes up for the lack of manpower in certain ways. So we've had to do a lot of adjustments uh, to be able to compete against the big guys today. Now, um, so the first uh, technology innovation that I want to talk about uh, is regarding uh, language paradigms. So one of the greatest things that happened this year, in my opinion, <laughs> uh, was the launch of uh, what's called Rust 1.0. I don't know, have any of you guys heard of Rust? Or you... <laughs> Anyone else heard of it? Or, um, so basically, uh, Rust has allowed us to write performance-sensitive code for both prototyping and for production use. Uh, so it's been incredibly helpful to us. This has made, uh, in turn, it's made us uh, faster in terms of putting our ideas into, uh, into reality. It's helped bring many ideas to life because there are fewer languages to translate from uh, in our, in our uh, code base, which is really awesome. <laughs> uh, 
so we migrated away from a lot of the traditional tools in the data science space. Uh, you know, we migrated away from your, your pandas and uh, your R data frames, things like that. And it's really paid off this far. Now, the main feature of Rust that, tends, uh, that lends very well to our you know, low latency trading realm is the combination of a deterministic memory management model as well as the modern, uh, you know, very expressive syntax. It's possible to use, of course, it's possible to use a, a GC in low latency trading as well. But you find yourself, uh, we, like we found ourselves basically fighting the language itself. And then that's never good. And so we've been limited to a few high level languages such as you know, C or C++, the languages that everyone else uses in HFT uh, and before Rust came around. <laughs> uh, and, and what's awesome is you know, good compile time error checking and memory safety, the things that Rust provides, uh, are certainly a great convergence of fast and smart. So you can get both. Uh, in this situation. Now, the second feature that really sold us on Rust is the productivity of strong typing. Uh, so what does that mean? Well, today we use very complex, very um, compound data types. And uh, we've had to build, basically, uh, generic code that works on all of these different data types. Right? And so Rust allows us to do something like that, which is awesome. Now, of course, uh, you know, these these tools and a lot of the other tools I'm going to mention are still in their infant phases, but this came around in 2015. Uh, and so we definitely highly encourage you guys to uh, consider contributing to these communities and you know, help them grow. They're still in their infant phases, you know, they're looking for more people and more ideas, so I uh, definitely recommend uh, trying to help out. So Now, the next thing I wanted to talk about was the timing. So, now the clock on your cell phone or the clock on your laptop, for instance, they're probably synchronized by a, uh, the network time protocol, or NTP. However, um, with NTP, there's a, a lack of precision and accuracy that is that we use in HFT to timestamp data, right? So it's incredibly hard in NTP to get nanosecond, uh, to timestamp at the nanosecond level, or even the sub-microsecond level. Uh, and so we've had to use other things. So for instance, um, one thing that's come around is uh, called PTP, right, or uh, the precision time processing. And PTP is uh, it's existed for around 14 years now, so it's not it's nothing new. Uh, it's like 3D printing, where you know, it's been around forever, <laughs> but then it just barely recently resurfaced. <laughs> so it's been around for a long time, but the adoption has been very slow, uh, and the commercial and open source implementations of it are still pretty inconsistent. So you'll see uh, some of the implementations are more accurate than others. That's not something that we uh, desire in you know, something that we expect to be a standard time synchronization tool. So um, you know, there's still a lot of people in HFT today who basically switch off their PTP, their PTP support in their uh, network switches because it slows them down and it doesn't, uh, it's not very accurate to begin with. Uh, however, we've talked with a lot of the vendors of these network switches, for instance, and you know, they're, um, they're very aware of who their customer base is. <laughs> And um, they're, they know what the problem is, and they can see that as they're working really hard, even today, they're working to improve their products. Um, so we have a lot of faith in, in them and what they're doing. Um, now, we are seeing more commoditized network cards with inbuilt PTP support. Um, so uh, this has turned, basically this has in turn lowered the marginal cost needed to capture increasingly large amounts of data. Right, and then there's plenty of room for improvement, of course, in software implementations, though. So um, once again, you know, just encouraging people to, to work on these areas, and then also, um, you know, we can become, I guess, faster and smarter once a lot of these software implementations are in place. Now, uh, let's move on to here. So now the next thing I want to talk about was, um, well, many people in the data science space, they're still using. You know, uh, Google Google's protocol buffers, for instance. Um, but we've seen the arrival of new serialization formats for performance-sensitive applications, uh, and serious communities have formed. You know, industrial support basically has, has been building around a lot of these products. So um, one example is called the Simple Binary Token, which is SB. Uh, you guys heard of it. So. SB is one of them, uh, and there's of course there's others. So in the past year, Google uh, released what's called flat buffers, and then there's other uh, things like uh, cap, cap and for instance. Now the techniques applied 
by these serialization formats, such as you know, zero copy or padding for cache alignment, etc. Um, these have existed for a long time, but this is an area where we've seen incredible speed gains by finally putting them to use. Um, this allows us to basically consume more data in a short amount of time, which is huge for not just our industry, but a variety of different industries out there. Now, um, one of the areas where we're still far from meeting our fullest speed and data consumption potential is actually in the area of parallelism. Now, um, we've been able to employ better models and squeeze more data into um, a small window of time. So we have uh, yeah, for analysis that each time we unlock some type of speed gain through parallelism, but there needs to be more. Um, we've, we're, we've known for some time that even if you're parallelizing your applications at the thread layer, you're losing significant amounts of performance by avoiding the vector layer here. Uh, so people who write compilers can see this. For instance, um, we'll probably get the, what is it called, the SIMD vector in C++ in 2017, but that's uh, still quite a long time from today. Uh, so the use of you know, hardware transactional memory is still in its infant stages, and most libraries for data analysis are still focused on parallelism at the message passing or thread layer rather than the vector layer. So another awesome thing uh, that has happened in 2015 is that you can now buy 57 cores for $250, <laughs> which is awesome, and add that to your server quite easily. Now, a 512-bit SIMD has been commoditized recently uh, with the Xeon 5 coprocessor, and our community would uh, definitely benefit from more tools built around the coprocessor architecture and vector parallelism. So this is another area that we encourage you guys to look into. Um, now, the last thing I wanted to mention is to talking about FPGAs, which I'm sure some of you guys are familiar with as well. Um, now, FPGAs uh, have historically been very expensive uh, because not a lot of people adopt uh, FPGAs in their industries. However, one thing that uh, the low latency trading space has done recently, um, the other thing that they've done is that they've commoditized the use of FPGAs. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we think that uh, there will slowly be more and more uh, use and adoption of FPGAs in a variety of different industries, especially in the data science community. Um, we found that any kind of repetitive and concurrent task that can fit into a relatively small amount of memory can be performed on an FPGA much faster than a general purpose CPU. So be it, uh, you know, whether you're working in like pre-processing for machine learning models, uh, whether you're working in you know, image recognition or compression or cryptography, uh, any of these areas, signal processing maybe, uh, you know, it's possible to accelerate your applications now with an FPGA. Uh, so this is one of the areas where you know, we're sitting on the frontier of this cost-benefit analysis, and we think that we'll go faster as FPGA development, uh, their development tools become more commonplace and cheaper as well as FPGAs become more and more available. Now, um, so, so now in conclusion, you know, whether you're working in the low latency sensitive space or not, whether your work is latency sensitive or not, um, we think that we benefit a lot from a lot of the work we've done in this space, um, such as SBE, for example. Now we hope that, of course, you'll consider contributing to a lot of these projects. Um, there's a lot of work to be done, and a lot of them are brand new. Um, even, for instance, actually, even high frequency trading, I don't know if you guys know about this, but it's a pretty new field as well. So the, the term HFT, or high frequency trading, was uh, coined in 2007. So, you know, it's, it's not that, that old. <laughs> um, now, just a couple things I wanted to mention uh, before we end. So, uh, one thing is that um, we've been very fortunate to have a very strong team in order to work on a lot of these challenges today. Uh, and so, we hope, of course, to, you know, we're always looking to uh, have more awesome developers and researchers join our team. Uh, it's always something that we're looking for. Um, and one thing that I didn't mention earlier about Dome Yard is that uh, another, the reason why we're able to attract a lot of these talented developers and researchers uh, is because we have a flat managerial structure. Uh, so, well, what does that mean? Um, it means that basically we don't have, so many people have asked us, you know, who's your CEO, for instance? We actually don't have a CEO in the traditional sense. Uh, everyone's title, every full-time employee's title is partner. We only hire people at that level. 
So, um, you know, we have partners who are all 50 years old, we have partners who are in their early 20s. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's their, their ideas that matter more than anything else. So we have this environment that kind of fosters collaboration um, and, you know, doesn't look at titles or anything like that, but rather looks at who has the best ideas, things like that. Um, so, now, um, you know, here's my contact information. So, uh, instead of doing a q and I think, I don't know if we, we might be out of time. Five minutes. Okay, so yeah, uh, since we don't have time for a Q&A, uh, what we'll do instead is, um, how about, oh, we'll just, I'll go into the hallway somewhere, and, you know, if you guys, I highly encourage you guys to please do come up and talk to me. Uh, I'd love to just meet you all, um, hear what you guys are working on. I don't care if it's finance related or not. <laughs> um, and of course, if you have any questions at all, please do come up and, you know, give me my card and everything. So, uh, thank you very much. Bless you. I hope to keep in touch.